Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, for Growing Up in Science with Jane Willenbring. Uh, today is going to be a quote unquote regular Growing Up in Science session. So the series Growing Up in Science started with a model where one faculty member each month would uh, join, uh, 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 like would lead a session in which they would talk very openly and honestly about their careers, especially the things that uh, were um, difficult and that um, went wrong. And uh, this is a model that has spread to many universities. Uh, my co-moderator today, Vero Carafini, was um, uh, one of the organizers at um, University of Graz in Austria, where she started this series. Uh, Jane herself also started one at Scripps uh, Oceanographic Institute at UCSD. Uh, and um, we are, are have taken this model online where we've uh, started to do these for open to the entire world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm particularly excited that we have people from a very wide variety of uh, fields today. So uh, I myself uh, am a neuroscience scientist and a psychologist. So that's often where we get many of our attendees from. But uh, be, uh, given Jane's professional background, we also have a lot of people from uh, geology and um, geochemistry and other disciplines that I would normally not easily come in contact with. It's really, really exciting. Um, you probably already read in Jane's story that she's not just professionally incredibly accomplished, but she's also played an a very important role in uh, addressing issues of um, uh, uh, like social justice and um, um, mentorship and sexual harassment in academia. And uh, uh, we are happy that she uh, can is willing to, to talk about those today. The way that this this format is going to this uh, event is going to go is she will tell her life story for the next thirty or forty minutes. In the meantime, you can post your questions in the in the Q and A uh, function. Uh, we will be uh, monitoring those, but you can also upload your each other's questions. Uh, Jane is going to address them. Uh, afterwards. Uh, you, know, you can use the chat for a general discussion. Uh, make sure to select all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, I think by default, only the panelists would uh, see your uh, comments. Um, if you want to comment anonymously, you should be able to uh, change your name. Uh, and uh, that's it for the moment. Uh, so uh, Jane, uh, welcome. And uh, we look forward to hearing your story. Thanks. And um, thanks so much for inviting me to share my growing up in science story. Um, I am uh, Jane Willebrink. So I'm an associate professor at UC San Diego at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And in August, I'm actually moving my research program to Stanford University. And um, I'm just going to start where it makes sense to start sort of like the beginning of my life. <laughs> and <laughs> I welcome anyone who wants to, like if I sent something that you wanna follow up with, or um, you know, if you wanna talk to me afterward uh, because of a you know tricky situation that you're dealing with or whatever, I welcome that kind of thing. So I was actually um, born in North Dakota in uh, the United States in a really rural area. So it was sort of like miles from the nearest like tiny town of Mandan, North Dakota. And I, um, my parents were um, very smart people, but uh, we were pretty poor growing up. So we lived in a trailer house and it was like I don't know if you know North Dakota winter, but it was both hot and very cold, <laughs> depending on the season. So sometimes not heated and certainly not cooled. <laughs> and uh, that was that was kind of a big like shaping, I guess, event for me in ways that I didn't realize until I sort of left and started realizing how other people lived. Um, I, I guess another like interesting thing that was helpful for me when um, when I was navigating um, 
a slow talking child was that I also didn't talk until I was four years old, which seems now that I have a child really late. <laughs> like, I don't know how my mother was not, you know, freaking out. <laughs> and then she had this uh, non speaking child. Um, but eventually I learned to speak. <laughs> as you can see and uh <clears throat> so we kind of like ha didn't go into town very much and um so i would just like wander around for miles and miles even as a little kid and would make like rivers in the mud with the garden hose and we had a little stream nearby the house and this is sort of like how this is how i played we didn't have a, a tv for a lot of my childhood so i would just like walk around and and explore and play um often by myself and that was that was really um also probably formative for me but i in ways that i again didn't really think about until you have your own child who never does that um and then i had a really hard time in uh, grade school, I didn't, um, I guess I didn't really perform very well um, because I was very bored. And then in high school, things were not good either. <laughs> and, um, but I really liked things like science and math a lot. And I, I discovered that those were my favorite topics, but I, um, but my, my high school, for example, was a pretty low achieving high school. Like it didn't have a, a real track for people who wanted to go to university. It was kind of assumed that you would just graduate from high school and that would be that. And if you didn't get pregnant, that was like you're doing well. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> Um, so, for example, we didn't really have like, um, there are no AP classes. I would say that the like education was uh, pretty bad. Uh, we would do a lot of, you know, watching of movies class after class after class. Um, and I felt like I really didn't get a very good education. And so science was quite nice for that purpose because you could sort of take the concepts and apply them in your real life. And you didn't have to so, be so focused on like knowing facts, which I wasn't getting. And so I felt like science was sort of my home. Um, and I was quite a, a joiner as well in high school. Like I, was, I would join lots of little groups. And I guess my goal was to like, not like to be different from everybody else that was there. Um, not that they were bad or anything. I just wanted sort of a different life and I wanted to be, um, I wanted to uh, get out of the sort of rural culture, kind of rodeo culture, I guess. And um, I played the oboe that was one of my main passions. And I remember um, now, I remember being like playing, practicing in the morning and being told to stop practicing, <laughs> which is so funny now having, again, like a daughter that you're trying to get to play like the violin and whatnot. <laughs> Um, and I would, um, because like it was expensive to play the oboe and to rent an oboe, I would um, milk my neighbor's goats who were about a mile away in the morning at like 5 a.m. or so. And so then I would do that before school sometimes and then after school. And then I would have money for like oboe and taekwondo. I'm a black belt in taekwondo. And, and then, um, and just like all kinds of like swimming and volleyball and like if there was a club I was a join <laughs> I was going to join it and then I kind of thought that I would play oboe I was really pretty good at it um, for someone from North Dakota like it was a kind of small pool <laughs> so um, so I kind of assumed that I would just play the oboe um, after that 
I really liked going to orchestras and um, classical music. And so, um, and then I heard that even people who play the oboe go to college. And that was, a, I remember that being a huge shock to me. And so two months or something like that before I college started, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go to college. So, <laughs> so I applied, I took a test, I think the ACT test, and then I applied to college and I got in. Um, and uh, so I started college and then I was a work study student for a guy who was doing work with fossil beetles. So, um, and that was really fascinating to me. And that was in the earth science department or the geoscience department. And I really loved the idea of the geosciences. And I started to um, take a whole bunch of chemistry classes and physics classes and calculus. And uh, I really loved all of those science classes and I love geology because you could use all of the different kinds of science and math and apply them to how the world worked and so I was really hooked and I remember so I became um, I applied to be a McNair scholar and got into a McNair program at North Dakota State University and then I was um, working for my my professor, um, my mentor, Alan Ashworth, and he had some samples that he had collected from Antarctica. It was from an old lake. And um, I was like, oh, I don't understand. I remember thinking like, um, you know, in typical, you know, undergrad, not having a clue phase. <laughs> I remember thinking there are no lakes in Antarctica. This is crazy. <laughs> and A, there are lakes. They're just not freshwater. And then he told me there were freshwater lakes long ago. And I was just like, that's wild. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. I can't believe that they have lake had lakes on Antarctica. It's so cold there. And he was like, yeah, it wasn't always that cold. And then I was just really fascinated by the fact that it used to be warm in Antarctica. I was just uh, really impressed that really impressed me. And so um, I decided to go to graduate school and I was reading some papers about where, who was doing um, field work in Antarctica, looking at the glacial history of Antarctic ice sheets. And a couple of different programs um, came up, one of them not working in Antarctica. Um, so I, I highlighted two programs with a strong field geology component because I really loved doing field work. And one of them was um, at a uh, one university and then another one was at Boston University. And so the university that I went to first to visit, I got accepted to both of them. And um, the one university I was visiting and then a uh, female student pulled me aside and she said, you don't want to go here. He's a total sexual harasser. And I, I had never, like before that point, I had always heard like in, when I was going to university about, you know, women in STEM and like sometimes they'd have women in STEM or women in science talks. And I was just, I would always like have this visceral negative response to that because I always wanted it to be, uh, I always wanted to be thought of as a scientist, like my gender really didn't seem to matter for that. And I actually thought that, you know, drawing attention to that was kind of a negative thing because it would make me seem like I was um, like physically not as strong or capable as of doing field work, which can be quite like just challenging physically sometimes. And so I, um, that was kind of the first time that I, that I'd ever heard of like someone treating a woman in science badly. Um, probably there were signs all around, you know, I'd never had a female like science professor. So that was a little bit, uh, should have been, you know, a sign <laughs> that 
things were different for women than men in STEM, but um, it had not occurred to me. And so I was like, well, I can't go to this university, so I guess I'll go to the other one. So um, sight unseen, I decided to go to Boston University. And uh, so I arrived at Boston and um, was working with Dave Marchant and we were doing some work on the history of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. It was an NSF funded problem or project. And um, it went pretty badly. So uh, this is something that like if you're interested in knowing more, it was eventually like documented in various um, outlets like Science Magazine has a whole story about um, if you Google my name and sexual harassment, you'll get a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, so I, I was sort of, um, it's kind of like the analogy of the frog, I don't even know if this is true, but the frog that you put in a pot of water and then if you slowly boil the pot of water, it'll like get so hot that it dies. But if you put it into hot water, it'll jump right out. So I felt like now looking back on it, that it was sort of like slowly heating that pot of water so that I like suddenly I was in this terrible situation. Um, but you know, starting out, I didn't really have an idea of that things were super weird. Although, like, I had some clues, but a lot of it I just chalked up to, you know, moving to the big city and how big city people were different and brash and not like Midwestern people. It was my first time, like, going to a big city or anything. I didn't know how buses worked. For example, I thought you just waited there. I didn't know there was a schedule. So I just waited at a bus stop until a bus came. <laughs> it was so stupid. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so we went to the, do field work in Antarctica and it was um, uh, my advisor, Dave Marchant, his brother, Jeff Marchant, which is not normal to bring your brother um, and then um, this guy Adam Lewis, who's a friend of mine now, and uh, it was it was pretty extreme sexual harassment at, in the field in Antarctica, and um, I, for example, he would call me a slut and a whore, like sort of on a daily basis, sometimes the C word, um, and uh, things also got pretty physical, like he would push me down and um, kind of like stay on top of me and like keep me down on the ground, push me down a hill. Um, with, like if I had to, you know, go to the bathroom in the field, you just have to go right there. Are no porta potties in the middle of doing field work. And uh, sometimes he would like, like throw little pebbles at me while I was going. It was just pretty humiliating experience overall. And I, um, I remember like at one point in like when I was there, he had just like um, taken the back of my backpack and thrown me down a, a steep hill. And I had like hurt myself because I was carrying this shovel and this pickaxe. <clears throat> and I'd kind of hurt my wrist and I was a little bit bruised from like basically tumbling <laughs> down this hill. I'm not laughing because it's funny. I just laugh when I get nervous. So apologies. It's not a laughing matter. But um, I remember just sitting at the bottom of the hill and just, you know, weeping. And um, just with like such resignation. <clears throat> and uh, like, I was thinking three moves ahead like you do in chess. I really love playing chess. And you know how you think three moves ahead and you can kind of see and imagine in your mind like what the next things that are going to happen would be. And I went through all of those in my mind. Like I was, a, you know, I'm a black belt. So like I, I actually thought about just punching him, <laughs> right? And then I thought three moves ahead of that, like, oh, that does not turn out well for me. And then I thought about all the other things that I could do and none of them would 
get me what I want, which was a degree to get out of there and to be able to, you know, go on to get my PhD somewhere else. So I was a master's student. So, so I kind of just said, like, I'm going to just ride this out and I'm going to, you know, ignore his treatment of me. And then I'm going to do something later on when I, when I get to a safe place. And I was thinking like to my PhD, but then when I got to my PhD, it became, I'll do it when I have a faculty position. And then when I had a faculty position, it was like tenure. And, um, so I eventually like got out of there. I got out of that situation. I graduated with my master's degree. Um, there was a whole bunch of like, you know, when we got back, I think he was a little bit worried about me um, making, like reporting what had happened in the field. And, um, and in fact, one of the people who was at BU at the time kind of knew about what was, what some things were going on and actually asked me to provide a letter for his tenure file and said, this will be totally confidential and whatnot. And then he, um, and then my advisor, Dave Marchant, um, came up to me one day and he said, um, I like, if, if you say anything, I'll ruin your career. And he also said, and I know you've been asked to write a letter and it better be good. And so I was like, fine, I'm not, you know, I won't write a letter. And he's like, no, you need to write a letter. Um, and then I had been told that it would be, it would be a not, you know, anonymous letter. Um, I don't know how anonymous it could be if like, you know, there's one student <laughs> who's a woman <laughs> and he's accused of sexual harassment. But anyway, um, I wrote the letter and I put in things that were true but that I left out all of the bad things because I thought that he would find out what's in it. And, um, and then later on, he like came to my desk among these big group of desks. Um, all of the other graduate students had gone home for the night and he had a copy of my letter and he read my letter for his tenure file and like mocked it to my face. So he had gotten the letter. So I, I did like kind of the wrong thing by not, you know, telling someone about him at the time, but it turned out well for me, right? Like it, that's kind of selfish and um, hard as a, a thing to think about, like how I sort of just protected myself and not the people who came after me. But, um, but I, I got out of there, like a couple months later, um, or half a year later, I got my master's and started a PhD program. And I was thinking of continuing on working in Antarctica, but after that experience, I just like wanted to get as far away as possible. So I actually wanted, I started working in the Arctic instead. <laughs> so like, physically the farthest <laughs> possible away. And um, I got accepted at a couple of places, um, one of them being Berkeley. And I often think like, you know, in hindsight, you always think like, oh, I wonder why I turned down that Berkeley job. And I think yeah, I took a position at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada. And it was basically because my advisor was a nice guy and I just really wanted to work with a nice guy. And uh, he was a nice guy. <laughs> it worked out okay. I got my PhD. I thought about quitting that many times as well. Um, and um, I talked to my brother who was just like, just just finish your PhD and then you can decide to quit science and academia. And I'm glad he said that because it's turned out well in the end. Um, but I was really excited to do something else. Like there was this bus that went by my apartment and I remember thinking like, look at that job. Doesn't that look amazing? Driving a bus. You know what you're going to do every day. <laughs> Looks kind of fun to open the door. 
And uh, it was basically like, I would have loved to do anything. I was just suffering so much writing my dissertation. Um, and then I, um, I went to my, um, I got married to my high school sweetheart and, or college sweetheart, college sweetheart. And then he um, had a band, like a rock band in Minneapolis. And so um, I just cold called this person and said, do you have any postdoc positions? And she did. It was like one of those serendipitous moments in life where like you don't think that things like that happen. Like people cold call me all the time and I'm like, no, I would advertise it if I had a position for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> but this is exactly what I did. <laughs> and so I moved to Minneapolis and then, um, my uh, husband at the time um, turned out to uh, be a cheating drug dealer. So we got a divorce. <laughs> and I changed my name back from, I had changed it to Jane Steiger and I changed it to Jane Wellenbring. And, um, that was kind of awkward because you know how when you change your name, people assume you get married. So like everyone, I'd call the credit card company and they'd be like, congratulations. And I'd be like, thanks. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, so then I wanted to get as far away from him as possible. So I, um, I took a, another postdoc in Germany, um, and, a Humboldt fellowship. So I'd applied for a Humboldt fellowship in there when I knew things were going south. Um, and that ended up being really, really fun because um, my supervisor uh, in Germany, Friedhelm von Blunkenberg, was um, like, when I was there, he, it was like he was my science soulmate, you know, like he knew things that I knew that I didn't know and I knew things that he didn't know. And it was just like a really great pair of people who um, love talking about science and things like that. So that was really fun. And we published a couple, um, I think, important papers um, while I was there. And then I, um, I was quite lonely in Germany actually, but I had my dog with me. I took my dog, my big black lab, German Shepherd mix, um, which was hard, like moving to a new country with a huge, like almost hundred pound dog <laughs> by herself. Um, but I was happy that she was there. And then um, I applied to a bunch of jobs. I had applied to a bunch of jobs the whole time and um, done like every mistake you can do in an interview. Um, and then eventually, like, I got an interview at the University of Pennsylvania, and, um, and I actually got that job, although, like, when I was interviewing, the, the, I was, someone was sitting in the front row, one of the sort of emeritus faculty, and I started my talk, and he said, you know, the only people that we've interviewed for this position have been women. Isn't that interesting? They told us we have to hire a woman. And then he said, but the other women, woman that we just uh, interviewed, you could see her nipples the whole time that she was giving her talk. And I see that you can't see your nipples. And this was like right before I gave my research seminar. And then someone in the audience said like, geek, that is totally inappropriate. And then someone, another faculty member, not emeritus, like laughed and said, ha, 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 that's what tenure is for. Um, <laughs> I just remember that as being like such an unwelcoming way to greet like a new potential faculty member. But I was really uh, excited to have a faculty job. And that was sort of my only like hard money option for jobs to take. So I actually took the job <laughs> and the chair at the time said like, I'm so sorry. He said that I'm so sorry. That's not how we are as a, an institution or a department. And that, like, I, I completely apologize. He's not around the department anymore and all kinds of stuff like that. So I took that job <clears throat> and, um, and then I was there for a while and um, I actually had a great 
time there. Like it was, it was wonderful. I was a faculty fellow, so I lived on campus with 450 freshmen. And I love that. Um, I'd wake up to the sound of like someone practicing the violin outside my door in the best of times. Sometimes I'd see like people crying because their boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them, but that was kind of fun too. And um, I think I was doing pretty well in, in at the University of Pennsylvania. I also met my current husband there and um, he like kind of quickly on in our relationship moved to Stanford University, but we were really in love still at that point. And so we're like, well, let's see how it works to have a long distance relationship. And it turned out to work really well. And then I got pregnant with my now daughter and um, we decided to get married. And so for the first, and she's seven now, so for the first seven years of her life, I've kind of been like mostly solo parenting her because he had a position at Stanford and I was here. And then in an effort to A, like do that thing where you apply for jobs um, when you're going up for tenure, and B, to try to like shore up our two body um, academic couple problem. I applied for a job at the um, University of California, San Diego, where I am now. And um, then uh, I took that job and that was a lot easier because then we're on at least one coast. So we didn't have to fly like California, Pennsylvania, California, Pennsylvania all the time. So that was really helpful. Um, and I love it here. I love it at UC San Diego. Um, if it were not for my two body problem, I would be here forever. <laughs> but I got offered a job at Stanford as part of like a spousal retention for my husband. And um, that is um, where I'm gonna go in August. And honestly, I'm a little bit like, I always thought it would be kind of hard to be like a spousal hire because you always wonder if like people really would have chosen you, you know, as a as a as a as a faculty candidate, you know. Um, but it turns out I'm okay with that. Like it's been so much easier to write papers during this pandemic. I know that's terrible, but just because he's been around the whole time, so like I've had like bizarro opposite pandemic where like things are actually easier for me um yeah and uh i guess another thing that i forgot quickly is that um when one time and at the university of pennsylvania when my daughter was about three she came to the lab with me one day and said um she saw me in like my whole tyvek suit and my gloves and goggles and all my lab get up and she's like, wow, mommy, you really are a scientist. I want to be a scientist like you, mommy. And like that just like killed me because like, even though it was like so sweet, it made me think about like someone treating her like trash in, um, in 20 years. And so that night I actually fought, like um, wrote my Title IX complaint against my uh, master's supervisor. And uh, I waited until I was actually at the University of California, which was a tenured position before I submitted it. And then that went on for like an entire year, that investigation and stuff like that. And then um, uh, someone leaked it to Science Magazine, not me, someone else. And then, um, and then it was the science article about um, you know, his treatment. And I had like letters from other people about how he did the same thing to other women. And my, um, that guy who was in the field with me, Adam Lewis, he wrote a letter as well, corroborating like the things that I said in there that he was present for. And um, I, um, and then that science article came out like the day after the Harvey Weinstein story broke. So it was quite like a splashy um, Me Too story for science. And so I think it had, at least in my field, I don't know if it made it to neuroscience, <laughs> but in my field, it, um, or cancer research, <laughs> in my field, it made like a big splash and everybody 
was sending it around and um, eventually like a year or so later he was actually he was actually fired he like appealed and then appealed again and um, eventually the president of Boston University just decided that he should be fired even though faculty voted to keep him on the st on on faculty so that was kind of like a happy ending and I should mention that there's actually a, a new documentary out called Picture a Scientist that you can watch. It's so powerful. Um, I'm just like one of, of the many scientists in that. Um, but it was, uh, it was really a, a great documentary to like highlight some of these issues and about discrimination as well, especially like how much worse it is for women of color. Um, especially like even around sexual harassment, like it, it if, affects them much more than it does um, than it does white women. And so that is, I encourage you all to watch it. I think it's actually like, this is one of the last days. It's either today or tomorrow is the last day that you can like go online and pictureofscientist.com and, and watch it. I don't get any money from it. So I'm not like trying to make money from you right now. <laughs> I just want people to watch it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I think that's all. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I still have fun doing science all the time, like every day I have fun doing science and I kind of try to separate like the profession, which I still actively work to change for the better, um, to improve department climate. And then the science is like such a, a different thing that, I, that still gives me a lot of joy. I guess okay. that's it. Yeah, I'll, have, I'll be happy to take questions. Would you like to say something about uh, your lab culture and, and, and maybe that department culture? I know that it's really close to your heart. Um, like at UC San Diego? Yeah, I have a, I have like just have a wonderful group right now. I've always had great group members. Um, but um, right now, like everybody's just so supportive of one another. And um, it's... Uh, at UC San Diego, I think that there are still problems, like there are at every university, but they really seem to value diversity and um, are act they're actively working on removing, you know, discriminatory structures. And I've been really happy with like all of the the recent hires that have been made there due to the like really great work of a bunch of people who do you know, unconscious bias training for people and um, uh, things like that. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to help change department climate as well. Um, I just took a, I'm one of the advanced geo um, sexual harassment training um, facilitators now. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to helping facilitate sexual harassment, um, like learning about that and how we can all help to get rid of it in academia. And I think that once we do that, then it'll become like in naturally more diverse place if we don't have a discrimination and harassment pushing people out of the field. Thank you so much, Jane, for sharing your story. Sure. I, 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 this takes a lot of courage. I, I find it incredibly admirable that you're willing to, um, like, relive these experiences. It must must be incredibly painful, um, so that others can. Um, it always makes me tear up to talk about my daughter. Actually, that like I have told it so many times now, but yeah. that one still gets me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, Vero, did you have any questions, or did you want to get started? Oh. Really? I was checking the Q&A section and maybe we can start with one of the questions and maybe I just add on a bit. So if you feel like, of course, one of the questions will be about the sexual harassment situation, of course. And one of the questions was about it, if you had some red flags before the expedition. So if you had some episodes before that and in case which kind of episodes and what happened. Um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, it was like his behavior was very weird and controlling before I 
started and just generally non-professional like he took a, an intense interest in my sort of love life let's call it or actually not even my love life like my sex life which i just thought like you know kind of big city you know thing or something i don't know it was a bit of a culture shock so i feel like i chalked up a lot of the like warning signs that i would have now just to being like a 22 and not having a lot of life experience to build on you know and then b just that i was not really used to uh boston and the big city and people were quite like you know in your face not like the midwest where people like would never ask you about your like you know personal life after just meeting you right so a lot of that i don't think i was quite you know just privy to um i also like another thing that's kind of a like made me realize you know having a daughter is that when i was growing up like there was zero that would happen that i was not like my parents were like handle it yourself handle it yourself and so it's sort of like i just had like this this uh you know um not even intuition but learned training to not talk about it if something was happening like if you got punched you had to take care of it if you you know someone tripped you you took care of it and so like i it was it was never even on my radar that anyone else would be able to help me or would help me and that is um another thing that's like huh it's a weird parenting choice <laughs> like now that i have a daughter i'm like i don't think i'm gonna go that way <laughs> so <clears throat> i think i was sort of like um you know set up to be a target but then i also um there was a woman who um, wrote a letter as part of my case. So she was there as a student before me and actually was horribly sexually harassed as well in the field. And she actually did all the things that you're supposed to do. Like she told the department chair who was a woman at the time. And um, after she got back from the field and she was basically pushed out of science. Like it, it went incredibly badly for her and she had a completely different upbringing. So like all of the times I think like, oh, it was, it was me because of this and this and this and this. I just think of all of the, the variety of people that he has sexually harassed over the years. And now I just think like this would have happened no matter what, you know? Um, I don't think that there was something that I could have done Although maybe, maybe we all have something in common. I don't, I don't know what it would be though. We're all white ladies, but <laughs> that's about the only thing that we have in common. And <clears throat> um, I don't know that it would be different. I doubt it would have been better if we had been women of color, you know. And then, was there a second question? Yeah, that I, I, no, uh, actually, I just wanted to follow up and it's something that also someone else wrote somehow. So uh, actually, I can only imagine how much courage it took to, you know, open up about this. And actually, I'm really grateful that you're sharing this experience with everyone. And I'm also conscious that these kind of things still happen and sometimes too frequently. And actually, I wanted to hear from you if you have any uh, you know, uh, if you want to share any thoughts or if it's something like this happens to someone, what do you think they should do? Because I I think not everyone, of course, is maybe worried of uh, being able to finish a degree, a PhD, uh, but if maybe, you know, from the experience of someone who went through something like this, what would you recommend them? Yeah, um, I I never know what to say to this because it's so dependent on, you know, I was, I had a case where I had many women who wrote the same thing happened to them, which often people don't have. I had a man who was there at the time willing to corroborate a bunch of things. Um, I had people, you know, who I told about what happened, um, you know, right after and, and things like that, like all the things that you're supposed to do. 
and it almost didn't like almost nothing happened to him at all um so like i feel like and it was so egregious you know another thing is that it was so egregious there was no like misinterpreting pushing someone down or calling someone a slut or a whore right so it wasn't like it was some like oh i wasn't you know i just brushed against her you know so i feel like in the best possible case of my case like to bring forward um where they actually you know took it seriously and did an investigation which doesn't always happen um and having tenure going through the whole process right that was even like so much for me to handle like it was it caused a lot of anxiety like i was just every time i opened my email i was like oh is there going to be like a note from title nine about him or something like that or am i going to see his name in an email or it was just like a, an entire year of of anxiety for me and the title nine people at bu like they there were two of them they one of them was like good cop one of them was bad cop while they were talking to me and it turned out that they were both bad cop <laughs> i had no idea and so like for example, one time one of them left the room and then another one came, or the other one was sitting there and she said like, oh my God, like I thought the interview had kind of paused while the other person left. And so the one person said like, oh, I would have wanted to kill him. And I said something, I forget what it ex exactly was, but it was like, oh, I, I have to admit like, you know, I thought about like all of the different things that I could do to get out of that situation. And um, then in the Title IX report, it says something like, you know, Will and Bring admitted to wanting to kill, you know, Professor Marchant. And I was just like, oh my God, that's such a, so like, there's such a conflict of interest in, you know, Title IX offices working for the university that I don't even know, like sometimes it can go well for people. And I know that the only way that culture will change is for people to actually report, but you should know that it's, it's not going to be like an easy road. It'll take a lot of time, a lot of mental strain. And um, it might not, it might not do anything. On the other hand, like I have, um, as a result of, you know, the publicity around my case, I, um, you know, it somehow it made its way to uh, Congress. And then they um had a uh science and technology committee um hearing about how he could be how dave basically how dave marchant could be funded you know millions of dollars in federal funding for years and they find out that he's a sexual harasser by reading it in the news you know or seeing it on samantha b and so then nsf um created these new policies around um, granting funding to harassers. And now NIH, N, um, the NIH has followed suit, um, followed in line with NSF's lead. And all of that was because like, it was really hard for me, but like it's had so many like good um, ramifications or impacts that I would never would have understood that like in the middle of it, I would have said like, don't do it. But now that it's all over, now I'm like, well, I would do it again. I would definitely do it again if I knew what I knew now. But in the middle, without knowing that like anything would happen to him, I, there were times when I was like, this is too much for me. Like, <laughs> it was, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> You know, I, I thought that Boston University would be um, like happy to get the information. And then I, I felt like um, they, they call it like sort of like assaulted the second time, you know, by the university, like um, sort of like institutional betrayal, you know, as Jennifer Freyd always talks about. So, <clears throat> so I don't know, I would say to anyone, just like make sure you do what's best for you and don't take it on as like, it's my responsibility to do something for, you know, science or academia or whatever. Like, 
it is not your responsibility, but you have my undying gratitude if you, if you are willing to, to, you know, be part of the change. So a quick follow up on that. So uh, you mentioned that the, the conflict of interest of the Title IX offices. Um, so it, it, it would presumably be better to separate those completely from the universities. There have been several questions also about what other institutional changes, what, what other uh, systemic changes are needed, should we all fight for in order to um, remove the protection, protection from, the, from the sexual harassers. And, um, and th this also relates to this very striking thing that you mentioned that um, Marchand had a, uh, was threatening to re ruin your career, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's a very a power dynamics that's very prevalent in academia, right? Where the PI pretty much has control over a trainee's career for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so what needs to be done? Yeah, so my, my institution, UC San Diego, I think has done a lot of things uh, well. For example, if you're admitted into the graduate program, you get five years of guaranteed funding to work with whoever, right? So that helps if you find yourself in a bad situation, you can just move to another lab. So I didn't, I didn't have that possibility of moving to another lab because I was funded on this NSF project and um, no one else had funding for me. Um, so I think that that is something that like as a policy, I think is really good. I think having like a diffuse mentor and um, advisor network is good. So being co-advised, sometimes it's terrible having two advisors <laughs> instead of one. But uh, as a policy, I think it is a good one, um, especially for postdocs who can really thrive in maybe that, that environment too. Um, and then having like, you know, a pretty active committee that meets with the student all the time and can have like time away from the advisor to talk to the committee. But like, I've seen so many examples of like, you know, everybody knows who the bad apple is and no one does anything about it. And that still happens even when you have those great policies. I would say like for from a funding perspective, like right now, it's a little unclear if the Title IX rules actually cover um, cover off-site sexual harassment. So even though Boston University took up my case, which is great, um, because it didn't happen on the campus property, it's a little bit, like now, it's a little bit unclear if that would even like be something that they brought up. So like if you go to conferences, that's not a Title IX offense. And then in my field, you have a whole bunch of people that congregate in, you know, joint field parties, right? And so if you are sexually harassed or, God forbid, assaulted by someone from another university, it's unclear, like, would you use your own university's Title IX, the other university's Title IX? Like, I, there's no good way of figuring that out. And everybody will be like, no, not us, not us. And then similarly, like places like the Smithsonian has gotten a lot of um, attention, I would say, not enough attention, but you know, if the Smithsonian can get NSF funds, NIH funds, you know, some of these smaller institutes that are not part of a university per se can get funding, but they actually don't have a Title IX mechanism. And so right now, the only way that you can report something to NSF is saying like, here's my Title IX, you know, investigation report. And so if your university doesn't file a report or if they, for some BS reason, decide that you actually weren't sexually harassed, you have very few options because the EEOC office, you know, they only do things within 180 days. Like, I mean, a lot of people are still suffering from PTSD 180 days after, you know, an assault or harassment happens. So um, there's so many things that, that need to happen now, but at least people are starting to, you know, think about this. And hopefully the film will bring a greater uh, amount of attention to this issue. Zero. No questions? So well, maybe we can just conclude this part about the harassment with the last question that we have about it and then maybe we move on to other questions. 
and one question that is asked is um, someone wondered how often you were asked specifically about this sexual harassment in a professional context, for example, during hiring. If you were ever asked maybe during like interviews or things like that, but uh, I think probably you, this came out after you already had tenure, so probably it didn't happen before. Yeah, and I, um, I think like everybody at Stanford knew the story already, so probably like didn't ask me about it in an interview setting. Unfortunately, <laughs> that would have been really awkward. I would have, I would have probably I would have talked about it, and I did meet with um, like a women in science group when I went to Stanford, and I talked with them about it. So, but that was kind of like a very specific like. Um, I honestly didn't think I'd get the job, so I, I was happy to talk to the women in science group because I thought that would be my only opportunity to chat with them. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so there's a really nice question, I think, that is about um, if you can say something about hurdles you face during your, uh, because of your disadvantaged economic background that maybe others can learn from and avoid or a note to speak up about. If you maybe can give a bit of background on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of, that was uh, something that I think both prepared me a bit for academia, but then also like there were various parts of it that were hard. Like, you know, um, people always talk about how graduate students make no money. And like I made less than a a thousand dollar when I was in Canada, I made less than a thousand dollars a month, like take home, which is not very much for living there. Um, but I actually was totally fine because I was used to being poor, <laughs> so <laughs> so I felt like I was especially <laughs> suited to handle being poor as a grad student because <laughs> I knew what it was like to just eat sweet potatoes for a week. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but then, like, there were times when, you know, I didn't have a, a safety net and I just, like, racked up credit card debt and then, um, paid for them. Fortunately, like I didn't have a lot of um, North Dakota State was pretty cheap school. So I didn't have a lot of loans from from them. But like just various times when like, you know, like, uh, just not paying off my credit card was just kind of a way of life for a while. And uh, that always like sets you up to, you know, have sort of a delayed like financial security when you actually do get a job. Um, so, and then like, because of that, I decided to be, you know, a, um, at, when I got to UPenn, I decided to live rent free so I could get rid of some debt. And um, uh, that was kind of hard because I was like, solo parenting an infant living in a dorm where I had some like responsibilities to these 450 freshmen. <laughs> and uh, so it just like it, a lot of that, like just caused me to have um, a lot of, you know, kind of um, it's a lot of extra stress that I feel like I wouldn't have made those same choices if I had been well off. A bit related to the two body problems. So, um... I, I could relate to that. I've also been in a, had that that issue, not not with an infant. That that, that seems incredibly challenging. Um, so, how did you together make that decision? So, what was there a, a, an alternative option where you would actually be in the same place? And I, I know these kinds of decisions are incredibly difficult and very personal. Yeah, I I did we I did apply for a position um, in. So my daughter was born in 2012 and I applied for a position in 2013 at Stanford and I didn't get that. So um, that was like pretty demoralizing. And that's why I didn't think they'd hire me later on either. Um, but <laughs> the pastor before, <laughs> um, <clears throat> same person over here. <laughs> but the makeup of the department changed a bit. Um, they were, they were, uh, more interested in like, um, you know, non-tangible things that bringing a, 
a woman faculty member into the department um, would help. And so, yeah, I thought about, I thought about not, um, that was sort of like, I don't know, I, um, I was thinking, I think if I'd had a son, it would have been kind of different and weird, but I was just thinking like, how am I going to tell my daughter about like the fact that I gave up a career I loved for her, you know, I felt like that was just too much pressure for her. And so like, if I had to like, just work longer nights, um, you know, a bit so that I, I could, you know, make a decision on my own terms, then that would be one thing. But like, I couldn't just like, oh, I'm pregnant. I'm going to take a job outside of academia, even though I've worked for that for the last, you know, 15 years, 20, 20 years, whatever. Um, that was just, uh, I don't know, I have like a kind of a, a determined streak in me. And I think that that was quite helpful during that time. She was also really easy. So I lucked out a bit. She was like such a good baby. <laughs> Do you have any more questions? Well, I just wanted to ask you one more thing, maybe. I read in your CV that you also organize citizen science campaigns uh, and uh, other kind of things that are maybe not are super important, but maybe not completely related to academia, let's say. So did you ever experience someone maybe in the field, maybe colleagues that thought that maybe you were not focused enough on your role uh, by doing these kind of things and maybe someone complaining in a way about that and how did you, you know go for that yeah so um my most recent uh there was a chair at upenn um and he like specifically told me that I need, I need to stop doing work on environmental contaminants. <laughs> and he did work on environmental contaminants. So <clears throat> I was just like, oh, thank you for your input. I, uh, yeah, and I was, I'm very passionate about, um, so part of my, my NSF career award was to do the citizen science on on uh, lead in the environment and that was something that I like when I moved to West Philly I noticed that like my experience being poor was so different and better than you know the experience of a lot of poor people in West Philly like the it's, it's just like a contaminated dirty environment with food deserts like I always had um, we grew our own food for the most part, like kind of subsistence like farming, but it was also always like vegetables and healthy things to eat. And uh, it was like a very clean environment. It was safe, um, pretty safe. And, um, and that was something that, that I noticed that poor people in West Philly just did not have. And so I wanted to do something about that. And there's so much, it's more contaminated than Flint. Like Flint gets all of the like um, press about lead contamination, but like Baltimore and Philly and New Orleans, like there are so many places that have this like completely preventable um, environmental toxin just lurking about. And the way that we deal with it as a country is we allow little children, we take their blood and then figure out from children's blood where the contamination is. And that just seemed completely backward to me, right? Like that is how we figure out where contamination is from like testing two-year-olds. Doesn't that seem crazy to anyone else? <laughs> so, so yeah, it was a citizen science um, campaign where we would set up and um, I would test people's soil for lead and cadmium and arsenic and things like that. And then um, counsel people if they had high lead in their soil or their backyard or their paint or whatever about what they could do about it. We work closely with like ATSDR um, to have people on site to help them. And um, they were especially, uh, you know, not trustful of federal institutions. So when the EPA did it, it wasn't really as useful because they kind of had a, this deep distrust of the federal government. People who have been, you know, um, 
living um, with this problem for years. So that's still something that I'm really, environmental justice is something that I'm still um, very passionate about, although it has taken like a slightly lower role as I like talk to a lot of people about um, sexual harassment in the last few years. So I'm eager to like get that back up and going. Um, one thing that I was struck by is that you, um, your interest in geology already started with your first work study uh, on the, what was it, the fossil beetles, right? Yeah. And so then, uh, was that a coincidence? It's just that um, it happened to be the one thing that, um, uh, uh, that you came in contact with and then you pursued that it could have been anything else? Or did it tap into some, something that naturally resonated with you? I'm always very curious about how, how interests develop. Um, yeah, I, I actually, like when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be an Egyptologist for a bit. And then I decided that it would be hard for me as like an American to do that. Like the, I was eight or something, <laughs> studying hieroglyphics in my room, <laughs> trying to learn them. And, uh, and then I decided like, oh, archeology span is a lot easier. And then I kind of got into evolution and climate change. And then I kind of got into anthropology. And, um, and then anthropology to me seemed like um, a little, uh, you know, it was quite a little too detail oriented. Like there weren't a lot of like, um, at least the stuff I was looking at was a little detail oriented. And I kind of liked, you know, big picture sort of things. And so I got into like a little bit more physics then and, and evolution and like origin of, of elements and things like that. So it was like this like winding path that started with Egyptology. <laughs> So there was already a direction before that uh, first work study experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe slightly related, like what what um, research out outside of your field do you find super interesting? Do you like to read about? Oh, um, so I love listening to Radio Lab, and I actually listened to this this. Um, episode on smarty plants it was called about how plants use um sounds to detect water and uh i was just fascinated by that and so then we started this whole uh research program around that on um using seismometers to detect the sounds of um in soils so soil soundscapes so that was one thing that we did and then i really got into mushrooms for a bit there and that led me to realize that like fungi can pull iron out of things like asbestos and that led to like a NIEHS funded um, project on how fungi can be used to like make asbestos non-toxic um, and uh, so I'm kind of like one of those like people who just like has lots of random things that I do. <laughs> but I really like the steep part of the learning curve, I think. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Um, Vero, did you have any more questions? No, not from my side, but I really want to thank you for being so open. It was really amazing and really nice to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you. I, had a, Thank you. I had a great time. Yeah, I'm going to check the chat. Not now, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe answer some things on chat. Yeah. So thank thanks so everyone for coming. And thanks everyone for coming indeed. Um, there will be more events which will be announced on the Growing Up in Science website. Um, but for now, thank you all for coming. Cool. Thank you. Bye everyone.